you. Thank you very much, Pamela. I love working with the crew at Opus. And I am here today with Pebio, you can see right here. Pebio is a French paint company, and uh, but of course they manufacture and, and they uh, send their paints all over the world. So I am lucky to get to work with them, and I want to do a shout out also to Layla and Pamela from Pebio who are in the chat, woohoo, and everybody else who's joined us from all over the world. <laughs> I love traveling all over the world, meeting new people, and I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Um, today, I'm going to be explaining or show and showing you um, about the Pebio Colorex paint line. Colorex is a bright, bold uh, watercolor ink, and they are so fun to play with. Uh, there are as many different techniques as you can imagine that you can do with any kind of ink or paints, you can also do with the Colorex paints. Uh, for instance, this, which is a, an anime, is one of the um, main things that Colorex artists, um, or artists that use Colorex, use it for is illustration purposes. And the reason for that is that the paints dry with a beautiful satin finish and because they have a satin finish, um, they're easy to photograph. So from a graphic art standpoint, they are fantastic paints. But I also love the shimmery paints that are part of the set, which are your gold and silvers. And uh, over here is an example of a piece that I did using the Bright Color X uh, inks, but then also I have silver here, and here's another one with the gold. You see that beautiful deep gold, but it's a watercolor, y'all. Yes, it is a watercolor. So even the silver and the gold, you can push around and get different transparencies with it. Uh, the Color X colors themselves are quite bold right out of the jar. So this is the type of jar you get it in, a 45 milliliter jar. And now I'm so excited to introduce to you the new Colorex markers. So these are the Colorex markers. And one of the really amazing things about the Colorex markers is that they are refillable here on the end. So if you have a marker and it's running low on the ink, you will be able to just take your pot of color here and put more ink into it and I'll show you how to do that a little bit later. Another thing that's um, great within the color, it's the Colorex line and together with the Colorex line, you can use the drawing gum masking fluid. So this is the drawing gum masking fluid. It comes in two sizes. This is the larger size. And my sister-in-law uh, did this. She took a piece of tape. Here's your first tip, right? <laughs> she took a piece of tape. Uh, I, I'm sorry, a rubber band, and she attached the gum that uh, eraser that we're going to use to remove the, the masking fluid with. So drawing gum is a masking fluid. And then these are the little brushes that I use for masking fluid. And look at that. They're all in one little um, package that's easy for me to find around my studio. But that also comes in the 45 milliliter. This is a latex masking fluid. And it even comes in a pen as well. And I'm going to show you how to use those. Um, the masking fluid is what I used here for the word Colorex. And then, of course, I put the, the bold paints on it. I blew them around with a straw. And then once the paint was dry, I was able to remove the masking fluid and reveal the white paper underneath. So that's a fun technique. And we will actually be using that technique today as we create uh, Sophie. This is Sophie the giraffe. And um, in the chat, Pamela was kind enough to, to put a link to the, the download for Sophie. So there's an outliner and there is a, let me show you, there's an outliner like this. And then there's also a color guide. Uh, both of those uh, will be uh, are available to download for you so that if later you want to uh, try this particular project for yourself, then uh, you've got the outliner for it and the color guide. And in when I created Sophie, 
I not only used the paints from ColorX, I used the markers from ColorX, but I also used the drawing gum from ColorX. I'll show you some tricks for that when we get to it. And then this last painting that's here is more of a traditional kind of watercolor effect. And I wanted to let you know that you absolutely can use a dip pen together with these uh, inks. And just bear in mind that they are watercolor inks, which means that they will re-wet. If you put lines down and then you put more water or paint over top of it, those lines can, can uh, blend in with the paint. Um, I like a, an organic look like that rather than a very precise look. Um, if you wanted a precise line, you would wait for the first layers of paint to dry and then come back in and use it as a, um, an accent or an outline that way afterwards. But when I created this sunflower, I wanted that wishy-washy organic feel and so I put the lines in, I was living dangerously, and I put the lines in first, and then I applied the paint afterwards. So I'm going to be showing you when we get over top of the table some of the ways that you want to um, take the paint, and you're going to add lots of water to it. You're going to add tons of water to it. Just have lots of water nearby, okay? <laughs> because you're going to find that the paints are very concentrated out of the bottle. Woo! Are they concentrated out of the bottle? <laughs> and so that's a good value, especially when you're dealing with even a bottle this size will go a long way because you're adding a lot of water. The color is quite concentrated. Uh, one last thing I wanted to let you know is that also the nibs for these, these are a kind of a, um, I'm going to call it a felt tip marker. Okay, so it's a felt tip marker. And if you need to replace the nib, there is a pack available where you can pull the nib out. And why might you need to replace it? Well, if you're a crazy painter like I am and you use all your paint supplies as mixed media, <laughs> sometimes you can uh, mess up your nibs by using it with uh, different media. Now, I also wanted to let you know that you can use these paints to do fun projects like this. So these are greeting cards. And do you see where the white is and the wash in the background? The white was where I preserved the white from the drawing gum. I just love the dandelion where the little bits of dandelion stay. And the last time I was with, uh, with Opus and presenting the Colorex paints, we did this project that I showed you just a second ago, which is the, um, the koi fish with that beautiful, I mean, look at the reflection of that gold. I just love that. And some of the other ways that I've used it like this. So we've got, uh, and you can see this is a more traditional painterly way to use the paints. And you can get really complicated like this. This one has a combination of both working with brushwork with the paints as well as going in, and this is one of the things that I love about working with the markers, is I can go into these areas close to the center of my plants uh, and make the darker darks by going through, and I can be more precise with that. So I love the markers for that. And then look at this one, is <laughs> almost completely made up out of markers. So I took the traditional Mexican uh, cactus kind of design and then used the markers all in here which help you to do that kind of detail work. Um, that's what I, I just love the markers for that when you want to get right in a precise place. I know you can have really teeny tiny brushes but I tend to paint with one brush or two brushes <laughs> and then I like to go in with the markers to get all that detail. Okay, it is time to come over top of the table. So Pamela, if you would do that. And I am going to adjust my camera just a tiny bit. I hope you'll give me just a second here. I'm going to bring you a little bit closer to the table. There we go. All right. Let's see there. Yay. Good, good, good. 
Let me turn you. Yes. All right. Let's move these things out of the way now. And we get to go and talk about Pebio and play with paint. Oh, that's the best. And we're going to be using a slant palette today. Um, this is my favorite um, ceramic slant palette that is on the product list. So when you do look at the list, you're going to see that. I mean, I, oh, I actually have many of these <laughs> because I have all kinds of uh, paintings going on all at the same time. Um, all right. So let's talk about Pebio. Pebio is a one now this year, 105 year old paint company. They are based in France. They have a rich history of fine arts, creative leisure and children's paints and children's materials. I love the children's putty that they have is fabulous. And if you go to the pebio.com website, you'll find that it's, um, you can get it in multiple languages. Then the liquid watercolor that we're talking about right now, the Colorex is a dye based paint. So I know a lot of times people ask, is it pigment based or dye based? So these are dye based, water based concentrated inks with that velvety finish. And there are 60 colors of the paints. And then there are 29 colors of the new markers. They not only come in the 45 milliliter bottle, but certain colors you can get in larger bottles as well. You can print this off the website, which is the color chart. And the masking fluid is a natural latex formula, and you're going to use that to preserve your white. And you can write with it, which is fabulous. It's got a little um, hard point to it. The trick with the markers is after you use them the first time, of course, you want to be able to use them a second time and a third time and a fifth time. And I'm going to show you how to clean the markers these uh, drawing gum markers after you're done so that you will be able to use them uh, over and over and over again. Now the colors here, these are the primary colors that I work with, um, with the Colorex paints. And you can see that they act very much like your typical watercolors when you pull them out. But also notice how constant, oh my gosh, they are so concentrated. Even when you pull them down with lots of water, they're quite concentrated. And then down here, I tried to lift some of the paint. So you can see some of them stain more than others, of course. And here we've got the white. So you notice that the white almost completely obliterated that um, black line there. So that white is quite opaque. What I love about working with Pebio's white uh, Colorex is that it can turn these liquid inks into a liquid uh, type of gouache as well. And I love working with gouache. And it, the push and pull between opaque and transparent, because most of these colors are going to be quite transparent. As you can see here with the blue, even the blue that's concentrated, you can still see that black line through it. Now, the two yellows that I mostly use are your primary yellow and your Indian yellow. I wanted to show you how warm the Indian yellow is. And uh, I love to do landscapey kind of things with the Indian yellow. And then here are your gold and your silver. Now, it's very difficult to relift the gold and silver, even though you can see the, uh, the fact that they came back up off the paper you really have to scrub it. So you need to use a good paper if you're gonna scrub those metallics back up. You see how staining that yellow is? Oh my gosh, yes, the Indian yellow, but we all know Indian yellow is staining anyway, right? Anybody who's ever worked with it. And then of course the magenta, your reds tend to stain quite a bit as well. But I also like to put, after it's dry, a little dot of water on top to see if I can lift some of the color uh, generally. And there you can see you get some dots, some lifting. And that's exactly what I want out of a watercolor. <laughs> now you can also mix beautiful secondary colors with these. Look at how bright and bold those are. That is a bold, bold, fiery, 
um, orangey red there using the magenta and the primary yellow. And then using magenta and cyan, you get a beautiful, let me see if I can get the color there. Oh my gosh, it's so vibrant, the purple. And then the primary yellow and the cyan gives you a, like a nice punchy uh, spring green color. Now, instead of using primary yellow, if you wanted to use Indian yellow, you can see the difference between having your cooler, I mean, an orange is not cool, but that's a cooler or a punchier version. But when you use the Indian yellow, you get a warmer version there. And the same is true of the greens. So you get more of a spring green here with your primary yellow. But if you're using Indian yellow here, you get more of an olive type uh, or a background green, green shadows maybe. So I love the using the Indian green as my secret weapon for the more little bit more muted and uh, more background colors. And then taking those colors and adding white. I, I just, I, I love the white. I love the white. <laughs> there is the color X white right there. Uh, oh my gosh, I just love the white. And so here is adding the white to your primary yellow your Indian yellow, I think this is a beautiful mustard color, your cyan to give you that light blue, and that's what I used with the fish and the water, and then your um, really nice mid-greens. Here's a bright, you know, the magenta become, starts to become pink, and then here it is with the uh, magenta and primary yellow and white, cyan and magenta and white. And then if you use the ivory black with it, you get a really nice uh, blue gray, which I think is fab. All right, then because there are metallics, <laughs> metallics look amazing on black, right? Most of the other colors are uh, transparent unless you add the white. So um, you're gonna use most of the other colors on a background like white because of the transparency. But if you want to go on black, which I have done, you can add your white and your, of course, your metallics also look beautiful on the top of black. And now we've got two different uh, colors of gold I want you to be aware of. There's a rich gold and a pale gold. And so the rich gold is a little bit lighter and the pale gold has a little more of a um, bronzy tone to it. All right, so it's helpful to know that. And then here are my other favorite colors from ColorX. This one's no longer called Portrait Pink, it's now called Pink Beige. And you've got an emerald green, which is like your phthalo green. My all time favorite, which is turquoise, I use turquoise instead of cyan most of the time, just because I live in Florida. So I'm a turquoise girl. <laughs> and then we've got the violet. The violet is just so, um, it's got so much, um, it's so velvety and beautiful and the orange, the Mars orange. So these are what I would call convenience colors that you can just grab. Well, there are 60 colors in the line. So there are many convenience colors for you to try out. <laughs> <laughs> Those just happen to be my favorite ones. All right, let me show you the uh, some of the techniques that I do with the paints. Because they're watercolors, you can do a gradient wash. And so just think of them as watercolors. They just happen to be super concentrated and immediately available. That's what I love about it because it's liquid. They are immediately available and they do beautiful washes like this. And then you can also do some of the other techniques that you might be used to. This is putting the paint out and then using um, like a saran wrap or a, like if you have leftover plastic from a package, <laughs> I hate to throw things out. It's crazy, right? As an artist, I, I, everything has use in the art studio. So when you put it down and allow it to dry, you can get this beautiful crackle. Love it. Thank you very much. Um, you can get that sort of crackle effect out of it. Now, I do want to let you know 
that you absolutely can do the salt method with this. However, I do want to warn you that the paints are very juicy. So you can, there is some salt effect here, but quite a bit of the salt just sort of blended into the surface because of how juicy the paints were. So I, having learned that, what I did on this painting, huh? so you can see I got the salt effect here, which is you put the paint down and while it's still wet, you're gonna use a coarse kind of salt to put onto it in order to get these blooms here, here, here. So what I did was I tried to be sure that I used plenty of water so that the paint was not quite so concentrated because the fact that the color was so concentrated, you lost some of the blooming effect that you would want. So you're gonna add lots of water to the paint and then you're going to let the paint partially dry. So it's not completely dry, but it's also not soppy. And then you can add your salt. And yes, you will get these incredible blooms with the paint, just like you want to and you expect from watercolor paints when you add salt. <laughs> All right. And then here, I wanted to show you how... The fact that you're going to hear me say this many times, the paint is so concentrated that uh, you can put the color on and then I spray it with water and just let it drip and you get incredible. Oh, I wish you could see how beautiful the color is. Sometimes studio lights don't always give you the best um, uh, concentration of color, but this has incredible concentrated pinks, concentrated greens, a little bit of brown but you see how beautifully you can spray it and let the color run and you keep a nice concentration of color when you're getting your runs. And I love that very organic look. Now, what are some of the papers that you can use with this paint? Um, the one that I use the most is a typical 140 pound watercolor paper. So that's, um, I use both hot press, which is a smooth surface and cold press, which this is, which has a little bit of a, um, a, a nubbly surface or a, a little bit of a textured surface. Um, now, you can also use uh, Bristol paper because a lot of illustrators will illustrate with Bristol, which is um, just make sure that you've got a thicker Bristol instead of a, a thin Bristol just means that it has a nice smooth surface. So when you use your pencil marks or your marker marks on it, that um, you're getting nice clean lines, similar to a hot press watercolor paper, which is very smooth. Um, and then you can use a quick wash of these Colorex paints or a quick brush of the Colorex markers over that Bristol paper. Mm. And it's nice and crisp and it looks beautiful. And then, ta-da, this is what I did with the dark. I used, and they do have this on the Opus website. This is by Graphics and it's DuraBright Black. So it is actually, it is not um, paper. It's a kind of plastic. But what they've done is they've put a beautiful tooth on the surface and so this paint will actually grip very nicely to that. And I'm gonna show you a piece of artwork that I did <laughs> on the black. So here is the finished koi fish, but I added white to all the colors, except for the gold. I didn't need to add white to the gold. Look at that, oi. And, but I did add white in here to the body and I added white to the blue that I showed you earlier. And so that way you can have some fun working on those dark backgrounds. I know that there's also uh, black watercolor paper available. So feel free to check that out as well. Um, that should work in a similar way. I like the way that this uh, gouache-like effect sat on top of the Duralar instead of soaking into the paper as a watercolor paper would. And then let me show you this one up close a little bit closer so you can see the silver do you see the silver there oh my gosh so this is what they look like 
in the jar. This is one of the golds. What you need to know about the silver and the two gold colors is, as well as the white, is that you're going to need to mix them well. So this color has mica, the, the two golds and the silver have mica in them. So that mica can settle down to the bottom of the jar. What you wanna do is you wanna use a stick and stir that up very well so that all that color is uh, suspended inside that bottle and that will help you to get a good color, um, good, nice, thick color when you're brushing that on to your surfaces. All right, now let's talk about Sophie. We're gonna get into that. Are there any questions before I get started with Sophie? I'm watching, I don't see any chat coming up yet. <laughs> okay, so let's get, and you can see I have a big jar the nice thing about the um, these various colors of the Colorex markers is you can see there is a color number on the top there. And that color number matches the color number that's on the jar. Oh my gosh, they just make it so easy for us. <laughs> and then there are empties. So this one that shows a zero right here, that is an empty. Actually, before we do Sophie, let me show you what I do to fill one of these uh, markers. And I do have a short, a shorty short on my social media that shows you how to do this. I'm gonna do it over top of a piece of paper so that if it splashes somewhere, we don't get ink everywhere, which normally when I work, there's ink everywhere. Um, okay. So the end of this has a little self-sealing um, nipple inside there. And what we're gonna do, this is the sanguine paint. So let me find the sanguine. So this is the sanguine color, number 33. What I've done is I write on the barrel for myself what color it is that I put inside there. You can take these colors and mix your own colors. So if you want to buy a limited palette and then color mix and then have your own mixes and your own marker colors, you can do that. Now you cannot put in these markers the white or the gold and silver because that, remember that particles that I told you were in there? They will not, um, they will not wick. There's a piece of, uh, what is it called? There's a piece of felt inside there. Let me show you another one here. So this is what an empty one looks like. And there is a felt whip, wick inside there and then the felt tip there. And so in order to fill it, you, um, you need to have a paint that's thin enough that it can wick all the way up here. And the, the white and the golds uh, and silver will not do that. But here, this one, I've already filled it and I wrote on it so I know what color it is and what color number. So we're gonna gently swirl this to mix the color. You have a dropper here that has the same kind of end that's going to fit into this marker. So I'm gonna fill the dropper and then you take the marker you're going to pop that into the, notice I'm not squeezing this yet. I'm just holding the outside and I'm popping it in there. So it just came to rest inside, inside there. Can you see that? Maybe better against the white. Now I can go ahead and squeeze this. Oh, that is so fun. I always love doing this. There's such a satisfaction in that. And all of it just went in there went inside the marker. Now, I have found it takes about, and then I just popped it out and it sealed back up. Isn't that cool? That is so awesome. Uh, so to me, these are very echo conscious, right? Because they are refillable and you can replace the tip if you damage the tip. Um, so now there's actually a little bit of color left in the end right here. <laughs> so I take a Q-tip so that I don't end up getting myself totally dirty. I just take a Q-tip and go inside there like this. You see the little bit of color that came out of there? 
There's a little bit of color there. There we go. And I turn it over, do the other side. And now you're not gonna get paint all over you <laughs> from the end. Another way that I do it sometimes if I have my water handy, I just take the rear end and I swirl it around like that and then just wipe it off with a paper towel. But I find really the um, the Q-tip does, or I think some people in, in England, if you're in England, how many squirts to fill a marker? Excellent question, Mar. it looks like Marlene asked that one. Um, I'm finding it takes six or seven squirts to fill the marker. And then another tricky trick, here's another trick. What'll happen is you'll be sitting there, it's gonna take forever to like fill the whole marker, right? You're gonna feel like that. You're gonna feel like it's taking forever. But what you're gonna see is it's gonna start to come down and then it'll get into the barrel part here and then it'll just begin to get on the tip. And I, I hate to wait, okay? I'm the kind of artist, I'm like, okay, I wanna get on with it. Uh, can you imagine that I'm uh, a la prima, right? Paint it all at one time. So then I go with the, uh, with the top here with a little bit of ink in it and I just soak the end of the marker like this because sometimes just getting it to that little bit on the end can take that just that extra time that I don't want to wait <laughs> so I just lay a little bit in on the tip like that and then it is good to go just like that ah they're so phenomenal <laughs> can you tell I'm excited but these all say zero well, let's see, there you go, now it's in focus. They all say zero on the ends of the empties, which is why I write the color on the side. Plus, they've left a little window here so you can have an idea of what the color might be. All right, so that is filling it. But like I said, you can't fill it with white or any mixes with white or the metallics because the mica will, will get stuck inside there. All right, uh, let me put these away. Oh my gosh, I just love my little um, jar full there. <laughs> now you can take the inks here and you can fill a what's called a water brush. So some of you might be familiar with that, especially if you like to uh, travel, right? Um, you can fill a water brush with your favorite color. The thing about a water brush, and I, I've done it, but what I find is because the ink is so fluid, it does tend to, it tends to come, let me get some water on that. It tends to come out pretty quickly when you're squeezing. See, there's like a little bit there. So yes, you can get that nice bold color. You can also get broken color if that's what you want. Sometimes that is what I want is kind of a broken color effect there. So that will work with the water brushes. But if you wanna get that more continuous line and preciseness, these are the markers that work great for that. And it's watercolor, so you can still, let's see if we can lift that up with a brush. What I've found is sometimes with the markers, the paint once it's down is not as re-wettable. There we go. So you can still re-wet it, but you can see the line that's left there. Of course, you can put down water. Let's put down some water. So that's all juicy now. And then what I find is if you put down water and then you try using the marker, it will work, but what will happen is the water will suck the, it, the, this marker works by capillary action, pulling the paint down and into the tip. So if you're putting water in the tip, it's almost like pushing that capillary action back into the barrel. And so you don't get the same uh, flow when you're putting it into something where there's already water down. All right. Okay, now we can get to, Sophie. And when we get to Sophie, I'll be explaining to you about the masking fluid. So if you've already done your, um, if you've taken your outliner and you've created your outline, whoo, okay, here we go. I'm going to show you how to do that. And this is what I showed you just a second ago. You have your outliner and you have your color, uh, your thing to follow along with the color. 
Now, on the list is something called transfer paper. So transfer paper has graphite on the back, or you can get it in different colors. So some you can get a, a sampler pack, or you can buy just yellow or just red or just white, especially if you're working on a black paper, it can be helpful to have the other colors. Um, and so what I do is you take the darker side and you put it down on your paper like that. And then you put your outliner on top of there. You arrange it where you want it on the paper like that. And then I just, some people clip it. So you would clip it right here to hold it in place. I just use my hand and I hold it. That's the easiest. Uh, <laughs> I always have my hand with me. So I do that. Now I've already outlined this a couple of different times, once with uh, blue, once with black. And now I'm gonna go in with a red pen so that I can see where my last marks were. Depending on the type of transfer paper that you're using, um, you may need, like I found with this particular one, that I need to use a very light touch with it um, because otherwise I'll get very bold lines. It just depends. If you want bold lines, use a heavier touch. If you want uh, light lines, just use a light touch. So I found I can just use a light touch like this, follow along with the lines, and I use the different color pens so that I can see uh, each time that I've done the lines, whether I've gone over an area or not. Now, using my hand here, if I miss an area, uh, I'm gonna show you in just a second what I do for that. So here's the eye. Let's do the neck down here. And then, okay, now when I, I keep my hand in place and then I lift and that shows you the portion that's already gone. So don't just lift this off because you're not gonna be able to replace it exactly where it was. That's why you wanna use a clip or when you wanna use your hand and you wanna put that in place there so that you can go back in. Now, right now I'm doing it harder. I'm using a harder pressure because I want the lines to show up dark for you. But when I did it for the ones that I have coming up, the cooking show style, imagery, I did not, um, it did not do it that much. So here, whoop. so you're going to see more is showing up. Woohoo! Now, once that's down, technically, they say that it's graphite, but I find it's difficult to erase it. Some people don't like a super dark line like that, but you may be more comfortable with your pen doing that. So you can go in with an eraser and you can lighten those lines after the fact, if that's easier for you. And if you prefer that look, okay. there you go. So now these lines are a little bit lighter for you to go in and do your watercolor work. Let's go ahead. Of course, I've already done that for you. <laughs> so here is Sophie. And there are the outlines for Sophie. I went very lightly with it. And you'll notice this blue right here. This blue is drawing uh, masking fluid, the drawing gum from Pebio. So uh, I'm going to show you here. It does have a blue dye in it. So normally I will shake it. I normally shake it 20 minutes or so, 15 minutes before I'm going to use it because I want the blue in there, but I don't want um, bubbles all around the top. And then before I use it, this is liquid latex and it preserves your white. And you don't wanna leave this open for too long because if you do, you're gonna end up with a lot of gumminess around the top. And you can even see a little bit of gumminess inside there. So what I do is I pour it off, whether I'm using the small one or the large one, I pour it off into a little container like this. So this one I used yesterday and it's still good because I put a lid on it. All right, it didn't dry out. It's in perfect condition and ready to go. So let's use this one. And now you want to use ratty brushes. What some people do is they look like to dip their brush in soap 
uh, to protect the bristles and then use the masking fluid. I just take a couple of brushes that are cheap and I don't care about them too much. They have the right shape at the end that I wanna use. And then these just stay, they get all kinds of liquid latex and then they get all stiff and that's fine. That's fine, it works for me like that um, because I find that you, whatever brush you're gonna use with this, you're likely to damage the bristles. So I'm gonna take this brush and put it in there. Now, as I'm doing this, I always have a piece of, this is just a piece of watercolor paper. I always have a piece of paper next to me because I want to be sure that it's not going to glob off the end. That's true of both the marker and this, uh, the brush. We don't want it globbing off the end. We want a nice continuous line. So I get the blob off the end like that. Then I tap back into it. And now I'm going to go in here and add the masking fluid where I want it. In this case, I already had it over here. This is where the eyelashes are going to go. So that's why I'm covering it over top of the eyes. And then right in the center of the nostrils there, I actually also am going to use black afterwards on the little hairs here at the top of the antlers. Oh, they're so cute, such cute little antlers. And then they're so fuzzy. So you see, I have to keep dipping to get it to come out like that. Now you might ask, oh, what if I make a mistake and I put it where I didn't want it or a glob came out and I didn't like the way that it looked. The really neat thing is once this is dry, you can just roll it, you can roll it right off either with your finger, if you don't have one of these um, rubber cement erasers, it's a gum eraser. Let's say that I made a mistake when I put this nostril in place. I can just take this gummy racer or my finger and just take it right off. Ooh, there we go. So I took it off and now I can go back in and I can do it correctly or the way that I wanted it done. Like that. Okay, so now one, and it doesn't take very long to dry at all. So you just, these are the whiskers. I'm gonna be, end up putting black where the whiskers are. Now I could just paint and then use the black over top. But what I find is if you want really good definition in the black, then you wanna mask it off first. So where these little whiskers are, if I had green paint and I had this brown paint, when I went to put the black in, it might reactivate that paint and then I won't get the nice clean lines for the black and the little bit of black in the nostrils, the black over top of the eyes. Oh yes, she's so cute. And then the little um, hairs at the top right there. So it works better, it, I find, if you mask those areas out. So did we mask everything on her? Let's see, we did the eyelashes, we did the nostrils there and there, yes. So we've got everything there. Now, let me show you the marker. The marker comes sealed and then you twist it to uh, break the seal. And then uh, it has a spare a tip here, which is awesome. So if you damage your tip, which can happen, if you're pushing hard, sometimes you can splay the end of it. But for the most part, these nylon tips are in pretty good shape. See how I could just pull it right out of there? All right, and then I'm going to shake it and I'm going to pump it. And we want the pumping to bring the uh, masking fluid down into the tip. Let's see here. Just like with your pens, sometimes this can take a minute. All right, come on, it's coming. <laughs> and the purpose of having this kind of a marker is so that you can have continuous writing and you can do detail work. So do you see the continuous writing there and the detail? I actually used that here to write the word. See the word Sophie? Sophie. So I used it to write the word Sophie. And if you want more uh, masking fluid, 
you just hold this down a little bit longer and you'll get more flow of the masking fluid to come out. So especially if you want to do detail areas, um, I don't have any other details because I, let's say I want to do some more details here. Then you get it started, you get it flowing. Now, if you go over an area that you already went over, what's going to happen is you're going to lift up what was there that started to dry. Can you see that? Hopefully you can see that. It's because I was using the tip of the marker in that area, it started to lift up what was already there. So you do need to be more like you just make your mark. And if you don't like it, you wait a second for it to dry and you take it off. <laughs> and then you can go back in. Let's see if I can go back in here. And I'll write on here. So I'm getting my flow going. And then I'm going to write Sophie. Oop, it's IE, isn't it? There we go. <laughs> so I wrote the word Sophie there. Now, the nice thing is because this is blue, you can see where it is as you're painting. And it is okay to paint over top of it with watercolors. I find you can use, um, you can use this drawing gum with other thin and acrylic paints. You just want to uh, test it out first and be sure that it's gonna work for you. Um, with that particular paint. Now, in order to, when you're finished, you want to clean your brush and you want to clean your marker. So the way that you clean your brush and your marker, you this is just water. And you do not, do not, and let me say it again, do not <laughs> pour this liquid latex down your sink. Because what will happen is it will line the, um, the line your pipes with latex and it won't come off, okay? So do not put it in your sink. What I do is I just use a little container of water like that. So I got as much of it out of there as I could. And then for the marker, this is how you're gonna get your marker to last a long time. You want to pull the tip out, put the tip in the water. Now, I don't know if you can see that, but it's already starting to, some of that liquid latex is starting to come off. Unscrew the top. Ooh, is it going to let me unscrew it? Yes. Unscrew the top. What you're going to find on the inside is there is a little tiny sponge in there. So you need that sponge to get cleaned out. You don't want it to sit there. If it dries with that li liquid latex on it, then the sponge will not work uh, effectively for you. So already you can see the cloudiness of the liquid latex, right? So I make sure that I clean the sponge, I clean the tip. Now there's a little bit right here of liquid latex left. So I also clean that and make sure that all of that comes out of there. All right, so now that's that tip is nice and clean right there. And these pieces, I usually will take my uh, paper towel and go down inside here and get that little sponge, get that little sponge nice and dry and get all the latex out of there. And by doing that, you're going to find you, this will last you quite a long time. Let's put that back on there. So normally I will wipe them down, set them aside to dry and then reassemble it back together. Here you wanna wipe that off of there. So it's nice and clean when you put it back in. And now it's gonna be ready for your next uh, painting session. All right, this water, like I said, do not pour it down your sink. I just put a paper towel in there and I let it soak up all the water and I put it in my trash bin in my studio, okay? That way <laughs> you don't end up with liquid latex uh, clogging up your pipes. Don't do it. There you go. Just clean that out and that'll be ready for the next session. All right. Any questions on using the liquid latex? I can see when the chat pops up here. Okay. So now that we've got 
some of that liquid latex on there. Let's get some colors going on Sophie. And the first color combination I'm gonna use is I'm doing uh, a light yellow or you can use primary yellow. So that's why I have this here. I'm gonna do some color mixing. So I'm using the light yellow because the giraffe's uh, neck, giraffe's neck and face have yellow in them, right? So let's use some of that light yellow and then a little bit of the, uh, let me make sure I get it right, the pink beige, okay? Or the beige pink. So that's the combination that I use for the yellow on her. And you see how you can just put a few drops in like that. And then I use white because let me show you what this looks like. Oh, and see where these lines are right here. What I do is I just roll that off when I'm done and then I can reuse this piece of paper for testing. It's my blotter. All right, so what we're gonna do here is use a brush and some water. So let me get you some water there. And if you look, the, that pink beige helps to give it just a little bit of extra warmth from the yellow. You can use just yellow if you want to, but I'm a mad color mixer. So what I do is I put it on a blotter sheet and I look at it and see if I like the color or not. And I go, huh, that color is very uh, translucent and very bold. But what I like to do is I like to add a little bit of white to it. So let's put some of the white out here. There we go. And this is how you can kind of lighten up your color a little bit. Ah, there we go. Now, what you need to be aware of is this color is going to dry a little bit darker. So it's okay if it looks like super high key right now because it's actually gonna dry slightly darker. That's why I'm gonna put a little more white in there. Okay, there we go. Okay, good. Now I've got the mix that I want. I'm going to go in here and I wanna do this part of Sophie's face. So now you're just gonna paint it on like a typical watercolor. If I want it to be a little bit more translucent or transparent, then I will just use a dropper. So the droppers are on the list as a, uh, one, something that you're gonna use quite a bit with these paints. There we go, to get it to, uh, because they're so concentrated. Oh yes, so here we go. Just come in here and do her face like that. So we're getting the yellow in there. Now, before I do the neck part, because the neck also has yellow in it, I want to darken that up just a little bit. So normally I will do the, the whole face. So this side and this side. And then when I go down into here, it's a little bit darker because it's the neck is turned toward you and there's a little bit of a shadow in here on the neck. So I don't want it quite so bright on the neck. I want to darken it a little bit. So I can either take some of the pink beige and add it in there just a little bit to adjust the color. So you'll see I'm working in the same color well quite often. I start with my lightest colors and then I work toward my darker colors. So now this will be just a little bit warmer. And if it's not warm enough, I just go in and add a little bit more. Now we're also gonna be using the sanguine color. So I'm gonna put one drop of sanguine, which has a little bit of a, a, it's a reddish brown. Oh, there we go. So now I've got a darker color in here that I can bring in, which is still part of the same color family. So that's what I do. I tend to use, um, I try to use the same paints and just adjust them a little bit lighter or a little bit darker so that they stay in the same uh, family of colors. There we go. So I would just go all around here. Now as a watercolor, you can a layer so I can come back in and I can glaze with other colors just the way that you would with a normal watercolor. So if you look here, 
you see how just adding those little bit of colors, a drop here, a drop there, you've got a brighter color on the face, and now you've got a darker color of the same color family on the neck right here. Okay, that's working with uh, mixing those colors. Now let me get another, let's keep that one clean and go into here with this one. Now, what I also like to do is, here is the Payne's Gray. So that's the Payne's Gray. And like I said before, there's going to be a bottle like this that's going to say Payne's Gray on it. Actually, I have it right here. And the color number is going to be the same. So I could refill this when it gets low. But the nice thing with the marker is I can come in here and do some of the marker work. So Sophie has a little bit of a kind of a purpley gray underneath her eyes there. So I love that tip because you can get precise and get in there with that. Now I'm also going to make her eyes the black. I'm going to do a light layer of the black right here. So this is a way that you can just define what your shapes are. And I like it because I can start seeing the, uh, the outcome faster <laughs> by using the markers. You can always go back over top of the markers with other colors. What I do with the black here is I lay the black in on the eyes and I come back later and I put a little bit of the brown once I've mixed the brown colors here. I put a little bit of the brown on top of it in order to um, kind of give it a little bit more of a brownish eye instead of just all black. Plus, if I wanted to lift some of it back out because it is watercolor, I can use a small brush with just water and I can lift some of that color back out just like you would with a regular watercolor. So you can see here some of that, instead of it being all black, there's a little gray dot in the center right there because I was able to lift some of that black out of there. And what I like to do is go in and using the black, um, also do the ears up here. So it's a quick way to lay in the black for the ears. You can always go in with the black paint, which I have right here. So there's the black paint. You can adjust the black paint by adding a little bit of the brown paint to it um, to get kind of the color combination that you want. But you see how quick and easy it is to lay in these areas with the markers? Ooh. And it's gonna dry with a nice, like it said, velvety finish in there. All right, let's see. Now, let me show you what I do for um, working in some of these other areas here. I need to mix some of the browns. So what I've been using is the Sanguine. So here's the Sanguine. You're gonna find the Sanguine is uh, quite dark red. So see how it looks right here? You see that dark? dark brownish red, which is perfect for a giraffe. So I could take that color and just go straight in here with it and start doing these, uh, these areas here, right? <laughs> I don't have to get too fancy. However, what I find is, especially when you're dealing with the area right near the head where the head is turned, I want that to be a little darker than the spots that I'm going to put down here, right? Because there's going to be a bit of a shadow on there. So what I like to do is take a little bit of sepia. So here's the color sepia, which is a dark, dark, dark brown, right? I don't put it directly in there. I put it off to the side because it's so dark. And then we're going to add a little bit of water like this. Now I'm going to take another brush just so you can see the color. But you can see it has like a pine tree brown, pine tree bark brown, right? 
So I don't necessarily, if I put one drop of that in with that sanguine, it gets super, super dark very quickly. Oops, I just got a bunch of it here. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so if I, what I, I put that in there with a little bit of water so that I can just pick up a little bit of it on my brush, a little bit of the darker color and drop that darker color in here next to the neck. That way, I'm darkening it, but I'm not darkening the whole section that I have here. And I'm able to lay in some darker edges there. Now, I just got some dots on here. And I wanted to show you using a scrubber brush. Does anybody have a scrubber brush? This is my Princeton. Uh, Willow's Blender. So it has a really stiff tip to it. Nice stiff tip. So if I want to scrub out something that I just got on there, I get this stiff tip and I go back in. And because it's a reddish brown, I'm not going to be able to take it all out, but I can get quite a bit of it out like this using a scrubber brush, which is great. There you go. So I was able to lift most of that color. And of course, I'm gonna be going over top of that area with more color. Here, I'm not too worried about it because I'm gonna be going over the area with more color as well. Now out here, I wanna scrub them down because I'm gonna be putting some more color in that outer area as well. So try to get your, if you do get your paint in an area where it doesn't belong like that, like I got some spatter, try to get it up as soon as possible. And it's definitely handy to have a type of scrubber brush handy that you can do that with. All right, so next to get the, the various browns, oh, let's see, I need to go back to the yellow for just a second because I'm gonna be using yellow here in the ears inside of the ears have some yellow like this. And this is where looking at the, your color on your color guide can help you to see where the various colors are. So I am just bringing it in. The brush I'm using right now is a Princeton. Let's see, it is a Princeton Velvet Touch. I like the snappy tip that it has right there. Let's see how snappy that tip is so that I can get kind of precise. But there you go, we go into the ears. Any other questions come in, Pamela? All right. Uh, no, so, no fresh questions. There's a, there's a question, some curiosity, if the Color X will work on wood. Okay, um, excellent question. Yes, it'll work on wood. However, what I do, if I'm working on a, a different kind of surface, and the reason I say it'll work on wood, the colors are so concentrated. What you're going to find is, of course, they're going to soak into the wood. So I, um, if I have wood and it's natural wood color, it's not primed, I will put a watercolor primer on it. So look for on uh, the Opus website, a watercolor primer. And then you can put one or two coats of that watercolor primer on the wood. Um, there are various types. Some are clear. Some are have colors to them. It's up to you, but you want to have a, a toothy finish so that you can paint these paints on top of that. Because the beautiful thing about watercolor paper is it does have sizing in it. It soaks only a little bit in. So you want that watercolor surface feel. And there are mediums available that will allow you to get that. All right, thanks Pamela for that question. Now let's do some of the brown of the face here. And to do that, <laughs> I'm gonna start double dipping. So I'm gonna take some of this yellow and I'm gonna take this sanguine and I'm gonna begin mixing my colors like that. So that I have now I have a color that I can put up in here. That's a part of the same. Remember how I was saying I like to 
keep all my colors sort of in the same color family. So by dipping like that and using the various colors, I can get it to uh, be colors that are happy with each other. Okay, so then I would come in and do this area. Now this area needs to be a little different even so. Let's mix it with a little bit of this brown and then come in here with that. So you're pushing and pulling the colors. Even sometimes I will put color down in an area like this that I'm doing right now. And then I will come back and I will use water and I'll lift some of it out if I feel that it's gotten a little, say a little too brown. Okay. And then the antlers, I wanna have the antlers be darker. Even so here. So then I bring, now notice there's the blue there of the, uh, where I put the drawing done. And I'm just bringing some of the darker color in here. So all these colors are gonna play nicely with each other. If you're staying in the same color family, your whole piece will look cohesive that way. All right, one last thing to show you, and then we're gonna go to the next step that I have already done here. And that is um, inside the ears here. I like to get some of the color. So right now we have the yellow and I'm going into the sanguine and I'm going to put little uh, hairs on there, on the ears. And that's where it helps to have either a really small brush, uh, like uh, these are Pebeo brushes. So I have a really small Pebeo brush like that. Um, I also have like a super thin one here. And, or you have one that has a nice, uh, nice tip. And I'm gently going in and drawing in a little hairs there. And that's how you can, I do use two sets of colors. I use the lighter color first, and then I go in with the darker color. Let's do this up here. So that's how you get your little hairs in the ears. Let me go grab this darker. Normally I would wait for that to dry and then I would come in with some of the darker here to add some drama. So that's what I've done to uh, get some hairs going for the ears. Now, I've already of course done this and gotten to the next level. So let me show you this one. I've, you see how I've pushed and pulled the different colors of brown. So this is slightly lighter than this one. In here, I've used lighter and darker colors to try to give the illusion a lighter color right here on the snout, but a darker color around the edge to give the illusion of the, um, this is in the background and this is in the foreground. I've also done, you see the little hairs up here. And now, uh, actually on the hair, let me show you what I did for that hair real quick, because I love this brush. Love, love, love the, uh, the mini fan brush. All right, let me see where I put my mini fan brush. There it is. So this happens to be a Princeton Select, but you see that teeny tiny little fan at the top right there? Oh, it works great for doing the hair. Let me get some of this in there because this is where it's going to go. So I first do the main. And then after the main is done, I'm gonna come in and I'm going to add these little hairs. So I'm just gonna pick up some paint on the hairs. Actually, I want a little bit more of the darkness there. Here, Oop, that's the sanguine. You see how I barely use any drops. So I'm gonna get some of that on the brush. You can see right there. And then I come in and I love this. This you just swipe up. And you're going to start to get those little hairs. You see the little, oh, the little mane hairs. They're so cute. Don't worry up here where the eyelash is going to go because I preserved the white. So you can go right up to the white and go over top of that little bit of blue. It's not a problem. 
And I've also used the same brush in the ears as well on this Sophie to get more detailed. So it looks much more detailed in here. And then the little hairs up along the mane here. I love this little brush for that. <laughs> it works great. Oh, okay, so here is where I've gone ahead and done both sides of the face. I've used the various browns, pushing and pulling the darks and the lights to do the, the top of the ear, the underside of the ear here. I've gone all around the ear so that I can get those little hairs. I have um, painted the mane and done all the little uh, brush strokes on the mane there, okay? So now what we're gonna do is, um, I'm gonna show you how I do the dots. So for the dots, here we go. I start with raw sienna. So this is the raw sienna mark marker and I also have raw sienna here. So if I needed to add more, I could just add more with the raw sienna. And we're gonna make little spots on top of the yellow like this, just random random little, that's going to be your, uh, the beginning of your spots. And then I'm going to come back in. This one says zero, but it was the sanguine, which was number 33. That's the one we've already been using in a lot of these other areas, like right here is sanguine, right? And so I have the sanguine, I fill the marker. And now to make these marks more interesting, I go over the edge of it with the sanguine. So these marks actually have double. I don't cover the whole thing. I just make a partial mark. I'll show you in just a second up close here. So you can see the effect. So what you've got is a double mark. And I just find that makes, when you're doubling up the paints like that, it just makes the, um, it makes it so much more interesting. Here, you can see her face. You see the double dots on the face. Now in this area, I only did the uh, raw sienna. I didn't do the double dots because the background color is too close to this sanguine or it may be exactly the sanguine. And so you won't see it and I just used the um, raw sienna instead in this area. But here I did the double dots and it just gives so much more interest to her face if you're layering the markers. All right, and then um, to get the green here for the leaves, I did a drop of the yellow. So you can see how easily these blend oh my gosh drop of the yellow and a drop of the blue and we'll use a brush on that and right away you get a bright green right now i want that green this is a bright 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 green like a spring green and i want that to be a little lighter so i'm going to add one more yellow and I'm going to add a little bit of water. So you can lighten that tone up just by using a little bit of water too. And then I'm gonna use that to come in and do my leaves. That's how quick and simple it is to get your various colors. If you just have the basic mixing colors, I recommend a uh, magenta. There is a magenta. And then I like turquoise instead of cyan. But, you know, you can, uh, cyan, of course, is your typical mixing color. And so I uh, put that in there like that. Once they're dry, I go back with either a marker or I add one more drop of blue to that to get a darker color. And that's where I get the veins from that I put into the, the leaves. So let's do that. All right. So there you've got your leaves, but I'm going to layer it just like watercolor. When this dries, I'm going to lay a little bit more in near the face so that this is a little bit darker in here. And then um, let's talk about the background. 
So you can mix a color for the background, but my favorite color for the background is this jade color. It's not on your list, but it's one of my favorites. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is put a bunch of jade in with that green and let's see what we get. Very strong color, um, but I don't want it quite that strong. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna add a lot of water, 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 water. For the background, I might even use a larger container to put it in so I can just add lots of water because I want my background to be super washy. And this is Pebio's, um, one of Pebio's watercolor brushes. And it has a big uh, end to it, which is great for doing your backgrounds. So we're going in here and I just, uh, I'm even gonna dip it in more water. I just, I want it super washy. <laughs> I like when watercolor moves around. You could even, um, and, and gives you, uh, the play of watercolor, but the trick is lots of water, right? Lots and lots and lots of water. So it'll do its thing and it'll do what it's designed to do. So that's the type of thing that I do to get a very sort of light and washy background. And then, uh, now I do sometimes go in a second time with the background, just in order to be sure that uh, certain areas that I want emphasized might be darker. And so I add more color to get that. Here, what's nice about this brush shape is that I can go right inside here and do that. There we go. So I can just go right in and go around there. I like to leave a little bit of a white line around like that. A little bit of a white line around it because then that just makes your subject glow and pop off of the page. And then the last thing that we have to do, because I know we're very close to the end, is we are going to take off that drawing gum here and we're going to put in the black to give Sophie her eyelashes and the little marks at the top here. So I'm taking off, taking off that blue. And now I have that little white area. And like I said, this is how you can make sure that you preserve your white area and your black will really, it'll really pop. And then the area here where she has her eyelashes. I'm going to take that off. Like I said, you can use your fingers to do this, but I, I just find I like this uh, eraser, this type of eraser better. Okay. And then the little nostrils and the little hairs around the nose. Okay, let's do that. So then what that's gonna do is that's gonna end up giving you white in those areas and the little nostrils here. Okay, there she is like that. And then of course I could take off the Sophie and then that will leave that as white in the background. There you go. So now it says Sophie. And then we're gonna put some black in there. So here again is the black and the black is where we're gonna put these little hairs at the top. You see how quick and easy that is? Oh my gosh, it's so easy and fun. Just like that. And then the eyelashes. We're gonna finish off her eyelashes. Like that. You see her little eyelashes. I go inside here. I leave a little bit of white area just to give the nostril a little bit of emphasis there. And then I can go back in and I can put in these little black hairs like that around her face, like that. 
And then she is done. Sign it. <laughs> Make sure to sign your work. Now to clean this up, I just take it to my sink. Usually first I will take a paper towel and I will get as much of the color out as possible because you wanna be sure that you're not putting a lot of pigment, dye pigments down into your land uh, aquifer. Okay, so I wipe this out with a paper towel and put it in my trash bin first. And then I take the residue, the little bit that's left over and I go ahead and um, uh, rinse that out in the sink. All right. Well, Pamela, I hope that you and your viewers enjoyed that. There she is. Of course, I'll put more over here and I'll fill that in over there. And then little Miss Sophie will be finished. All right. Any last minute questions? You know, there's one, <laughs> there's one more question here in the chat um, uh -huh. before we head out for the day. Um, did the ColorX inks, did they dry really matte or do they have any kind of shine to them? The paints, thank you for the question. The paints dry super matte. <laughs> It, I don't know if you can see here, but it's very matte. They photograph beautifully. I mean, it's so nice. Um, I love the photographs I get out of these works. And then, um, except of course, for the silver and the two golds. So the silver and the two golds are going to um, come out shiny, which makes them a little tricky for photography. Here is the silver. Do you see the silver? Um, and so, you know, the silver and the golds, they are shiny. But if you're dealing with the rest of the paints, they're beautiful. They, they come out <laughs> so beautifully matte. Oh, my gosh. I just love how easy they are to photograph. All right. Any other last minute questions? I appreciate you all coming in. And I hope that you'll... Uh, Go to my website, go to the Pebio website, go to the Opus website, buy some of the paints. <laughs> oh. Thank you so much, Tristina. And everyone for being here. That was a lot of fun. Colorful, bold, bright. Um, let's do it again. I hope to see you again sometime, Tristina. And everyone, I hope to see you again on the demo platform. I hope and have a beautiful creative day. Thank you. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.